Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the January 17th, 2022 school board meeting, the first school board meeting of 2022. At this time, I would like to have Joe Emerson come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Don't run away, Joe. We've got something for you. <laughs> All right, so welcome again. Um, we are glad to be here at Central Middle. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our principal, Mr. John Haga, to welcome us. Good evening and welcome to Central Middle School. Right, we are very excited to have you. I want to take a second to thank uh, the Board of Education for joining us, uh, Superintendent B, my fellow administrators, uh, the amazing Forest Hills Public Schools teachers, students, uh, and you all here, our community, uh, the ones we work for, the ones we continue to advocate for. Uh, here at Central Middle School, we have a very simple but powerful saying, every student, every day something we believe in, something we live, something that our students, staff, and uh, hopefully our community rally behind. Uh, today, I'm honored to share the stage with the true leaders of our building, our student council. They work tirelessly. Uh, they meet once, twice, sometimes during class, sometimes during their free time after school to really make sure that the community that we build here at Central Middle School is something to be proud of, something where every student every day comes to this school uh, prepared to learn and prepared to succeed. So I want to introduce them. Uh, I'm going to start with having Lydia, Joe, and Avery, our student council presidents, come up, and they are going to share a little bit about student council and then share a special project they're working on. Hi, I'm Lydia Mori. I'm the eighth grade student council president. Uh, we want to thank the board and the community for your time tonight. It's an honor to get to share what we've been working on with you. Hi, I'm Avery LaJoy, one of the seventh grade student counselor co-president. And I'm Joe Emerson, the other seventh grade co-president. Um, this is our vision statement that drives all of our work and decisions in student council. Um, we call it our Who Are We? Um, we are student leaders and we embody what it means to be ranger strong, kind, respect, responsible, and respectful. We are advocates, we represent our classmates and listen to their needs and give them a voice. Um, we are change makers. We make positive change in our school, community, and world. Um, and we are social unifiers, bringing people together throughout planning and hosting fun events. These are some of the events we have created so far. We led an electoral process to choose presidents, a secretary, and a treasurer. We've led local and national fundraising. We, we've led fundraisers for local and national causes, including our Operation Give Back, which looks to donate important resources to veterans in our com community in need. We've held positive community building events, such as school wide spirit weeks, to celebrate our ranger spirit all year long. We are currently planning a student led peer tutoring club to help those in academic need in our school and to also provide an opportunity for people in our school to give back to our school community. We created a school-wide lesson to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Some of our student council members who have been working really hard on this project are here to tell you about it. Hi, my name is Carrington. I'm here with DJ, Shania, Leah, Josie, and Maria. 
We all volunteered to work on this Martin Luther King Jr. Day lesson. To me, celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. Day means honoring a man that has changed the lives of many people. He is important to learn about because he has used peaceful methods to help people of color gain more rights. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has changed our world for the better. We have to pass his message of love and unity on to other people and carry out his legacy. It's important to learn about people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who have helped shape our country into a more kind, responsible, and respectful place, the kind of place we want CMS community to be. We gave all the 7th and 8th grade teachers a slideshow with the Martin Luther King Jr. lesson we created. We researched MLK Jr. and found a video packed with important information about his life and work. We used what we learned to create questions for students, and then DJ combined all of our ideas into a Book It for students to play. If you aren't familiar with it, Book It is an awesome online learning platform where you can create interactive quiz games and students love it. Then we have gathered fun Martin Luther King extension activities for students like coloring sheets and crossword puzzles. Um, this is just one of the amazing things we have done while we've worked in student council. We're really proud of all the work we've done so far and are excited for future projects to come to make CMS and our community a better place. Thank you for letting us show you all some of what we've accomplished this year as a student council and enjoy the rest of your meeting. Now don't walk, don't walk away so fast. <laughs> Don't walk away so fast. Thank you so much for sharing this evening. Um, there's no way we could uh, thank you for all of the things that you've done so far this year. But I want to ask if any of the board members have any questions for you while you're here or any comments. Great work. I mean, really impressed with all the work you put together there. I mean, that's a teacher's curriculum plan. That's great work. Did you have fun doing it? Did you enjoy it? I can tell you did. Mm -hmm. Great work. I do want to say, team, that I just learned about Look It like four hours ago, <laughs> and you're already on top of it and creating this to share with your, your like fellow students. I think that is phenomenal. Way to be leaders. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And the fact that you are putting together these um, curriculum plans for your peers and working to be kind, responsible, and respectful in your community is great. Um, I'm hoping there's some future teachers and leaders right in that group right there. There's a good chance of it. So thanks a lot. Have a great night. All right. I think we will move over. We have a couple presentations here, Mr. Beam, if you want to direct these. Sure. We have uh, our instructional highlight tonight. Mr. Haga, uh, our principal here, is going to... That was it. Thank that you very it. much. I'm it. sorry. We're moving yeah, we're right moving along with that the good. welcome and the instructional highlight. What I was going to point out is Mr. Haga is so efficient with yes. his time and his leadership. Yes. Uh, he yep. does a great work there. There's so, the time frame, and we like to stick to it. I like that, it's, Mr. Haga. So, that's yes. right. Thank yes. you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Just want to make sure we didn't miss anything, and that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, what we'd like to do, a couple uh, presentations now. Julie Davis, our Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations, will provide an update with us with where we are with our transportation operations. As we know, transportation operations have been a challenge, not only for Forest Hills, but for school districts all over the country. And not only moving people, our most important uh, thing that we, we do and work with people, but also moving goods all over the country. But in this case, we are going to stick to our uh, student transportation program. And I'll turn it over to Mrs. Davis to provide us with an update. Julie. Wonderful. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Beam. So as the superintendent said, I just thought I'd take a few minutes here of your meeting tonight to share an update on transportation and kind of where we're at. Um, so it's a hot market, right? We, we talked about um, other districts who are kind of in the same situation as us, uh, a lack of bus drivers. And so we have done some things to try to make our bus driver position more attractive. Um, so we had a contract sentiment um, that you approved at the September 20 meeting. Um, in that sentiment, we had hourly pay increases that ranged from $1.67 an hour to $2.19 an hour. Um, our bus drivers have a six-step. Um, a lot of times in school districts, uh, employee groups, 
have a step system for, for their pay rates. So our bus drivers have a six step system. Um, we also, in this settlement, um, offered earlier access to medical, dental, and vision insurance. Um, we increased vacation and sick days. We also increased the cash in lieu amount. So for those who um, are eligible and don't elect medical insurance, they can get a, a cash in lieu payment. Um, and then one of the things that we often hear, both at the negotiating table and out in the community, is um, comparisons to other districts, right? And, and, and that makes sense. So one of uh, what's important when you look at that is um, a contract is, is large. There are a lot of moving parts in a contract, and so when you just look at the pay rate, um, it's not always apples to apples um, because there are other portions of the contract that may be attractive for uh, potential applicants. So, for example, longevity. Um, in school districts, um, a lot of times they have a longevity payment to try to retain staff. Um, in Forest Hills, we have a longevity uh, system for our bus drivers that after that sixth step, they receive 15 cents an hour extra every year, for example. Um, some counterparts across the area, it's all different. Sometimes it's a lump sum payment after 10 years, after 15 years. Sometimes it's an hourly rate after 10 years, and then it goes up again in 15 years. So there's a variety of components in every employee group contract. Um, so it's all, everything kind of bundled together that make, hopefully, an attractive uh, position for the district. Um, we've done some things on the recruitment and outreach side. So we've held two ride and drive fairs. Um, one was more successful than the other one and had happened to do with the weather, I would suspect. So we held our first one in September. Um, uh, heavily attended, um, it netted us uh, several drivers and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Um, and then we held another one at the beginning of December and like I said, um, December we learn as we go and may not have been the best time to do that. So we'll look as we move through and um, potentially holding another one maybe this early spring um, when this cold weather breaks. Um, we've done billboard advertising in the area. We've also um, been advertising on the back of cash register receipts. So when you go to, say, a D&W, um, the uh, Forest Hills Foods, um, the Ada Fresh Market, those are places that we are starting to advertise for not only our bus driver positions, but some of our other support staff positions like food service, child care, um, and I'm missing one, custodians and cleaners. And then other recruitment and outreach that we are um, going through right now is some financial incentives. So currently we have a sign-on bonus for up to $1,500 for new drivers. And then we also um, kind of put out a plea to our current employees to say, hey, if you know anybody who you think would be interested, um, there would be a $500 referral buses referral for those uh, new drivers that come on board. So um, these are some of the things we haven't had to do in the past, right? We've We've had some fairs in the past where we've invited uh, drivers to come, but the ride and drive seemed to be successful because they actually got to drive the bus on property. They didn't go out onto the city streets, um, which we can do legally. So that was a big hit because then it didn't seem so big and scary for those people who thought they might be interested. So like I said, we'll continue to do that um, and hope to uh, recruit more bus drivers because we still are short. So here's where we're at with bus driver staffing. Um, to date, um, we have several new drivers, as you can see, 11 new drivers for our regular route positions, and we also have a couple of drivers who, who couldn't commit to a full-time regular route, but wanted to still support the district, and so they're in substitute positions, working a lot these days, but um, didn't want to make that full-time commitment. Um, at the same time, we also had drivers who have um, left the district. We have uh, two drivers who took a, went into a new line of work, um, but still felt passionate about supporting the district and wanted to remain in a sub status. So if there was a need, we'll reach out to them. And if they can drive for us, they will. Um, we have two drivers who actually took other positions within the district. For example, one of our drivers recently moved into the head custodian position at Central High. Um, and then we had three drivers who left um, for the reasons you can see on the board. Uh, one relocated, one is a, a medical reason, and then one was just another reason. So. You kind of feel like you're making two steps forward and you take a step back with drivers, but um, wanted to be able to share with you where we're at. It certainly doesn't feel good um, when we have to cancel routes each week. I know I um, uh, talk to my counterparts all the time and everybody's doing everything they can 
Kentwood, I think they have four different runs that they make. They have students who aren't getting home until 6 o'clock at night um, because the bus is just continuing to go back, pick up students, and then um, take them home. So, um, you know, everybody's feeling the pinch um, of where we're at, and we're just hopefully at some point feel a turnaround. So I don't know if you have any questions. I don't have any questions. I'll just echo that um, I was in Midland for a work event and just in the informal conversations, everybody there was talking about how it was in that community. And then we were up in Big Rapids for a DECA event and just out of the blue, somebody that was from Gaylord that was there and we ended up talking about buses. So um, I definitely don't think it's a unique position. Um, I appreciate all the work you're doing. We appreciate all the work you're doing. Um, the one thing that I will say is a bright spot is the, that bullet where it says other district positions. So I love the fact that you know people want to work in Forest Hills and continue to support our students. So hang in there. <laughs> That's what I could say. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Um, our final presentation tonight is uh, something we do every year in January. January is National School Board of Education Appreciation Month. And so at our January meeting, we have just a small gift, a small token of appreciation for the members of our Board of Education. But I would just like to say a few words uh, for the members of our Board of Education. Uh, school board members are people who truly are called to help their community, to help uh, their students, their families, uh, the community as a whole. Uh, there's no compensation that comes with these positions. Uh, in, in fact, in terms of financial outlay, uh, board members uh, write checks to various uh, things to help support the district in different ways. Uh, so it's, it's not something they're doing for financial gain. And as we've seen across the country, uh, as we are in uh, solidly uh, coming to a close on two years of a pandemic, there's lots of frustration about a lot of things. And as we've seen all over, uh, boards of education, over 14,000 of them in our country, are uh, a source for vetting that frustration. And certainly, uh, these volunteer members of our community have, uh, have, have been here and, and trying to do the best we can in a time of challenge and difficulty for communities all over the country to make sure our kids get the education that they need and deserve and can, can find and follow their dreams. And our Board of Education has been steadfast in that uh, mission and steadfast in looking to say, what is it we can do to support our students all across the district at a time where there aren't uh, universally accepted answers of what to do uh, in, in respect to the many challenges that we have with the pandemic, but also to make sure that our students have an education that prepares them for their future not something that is familiar to us for, for our own past on that. Uh, so I am so very appreciative. Uh, all these members come here with the agenda of doing what it is that is best for children. Uh, they don't come here to seek higher political office. They're not coming here with a partisan bent. They're coming here to see what is it we can do to help kids. And I've seen that over and over in my years. And this past year especially, uh, the, the dedication and the commitment from the members of our Board of Education to our community and most importantly uh, to the students uh, that attend our schools has really been phenomenal. So on behalf of a grateful staff at Forest Hills Public School, I'd just like to say thank you to the uh, members of our Board of Education. We have a small appreciation gift uh, for you at your table. And please know that uh, the esteem and the appreciation of our staff and our community members are with you. I hear it often. I hope you do as well. So again, on behalf of the Forest Hills Public School staff, thank you so much. And congratulations uh, for National School Board Recognition Month. Thanks for all that you do. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Um, I would like to, um, oh, I appreciate that on behalf of all of the board. Um, I wanted to take this time to also recognize a member of the Board of Education. Uh, <laughs> does that scare you a little bit? 
So I, uh, I did want to make a couple comments for, uh, to Mary specifically, and I did make a, a few notes here to keep me on track. Um, so I, I um, I'm, think this speaks on behalf of these people, but there are a few 2003 references in here. So I would like to share my deep appreciation and gratitude for the decades of service that Mary Vonk has brought to the district as a parent, a volunteer, and an advocate for our students and staff to an exponential degree. Um, you have really been a bridge to our current board um, from, of the rich traditions and all the important people in our community and the district and prior board members. And for that, I'm grateful, and I think all the newer board members are grateful for that bridge. Um, your, as Dan mentioned, your steadfast focus on what's best for kids through your words and actions is the lens we will maintain while you wrap up your final months on the board. Um, believe it or not, yeah. Um, those, were, uh, those who were here will carry that as a guidepost, regardless of what gets thrown in our way. We will carry on with grace and humor, as long as I'm here, right? <laughs> with grace, humor, and humility. We have had some amazing celebrations in our time together. Um, on the board and as friends, which I think it was a fateful day at Ada Vista in probably 2003, some in our shorts and t-shirts doing who knows what at a field day, or I, I don't even know. Um, I guess my final words are, if I had to go back and fill out the um, emergency contact form for my kids, remember when you do that in kindergarten? You would definitely be on the top of my list. So, thank you, Mary Vaughn. And that's all. <laughs> I'm not used to having to turn on my microphone, uncalled for, and I, right, I was not expecting that, and I was trying to figure out when to say this, but it's so fun to sit over on this side of the table and see the incredibly capable hands that will lead us forward into a future where we are going to redesign the classroom for all the kids in Forest Hills and set models for other districts all over the country, I'm hoping. So, so excited to see you sitting there, so excited for the change that is taking place, and that was very sweet of you, Mrs. Callahan. Thank you. All right. Well, with that in mind, um, we are going to move to the next portion of our meeting, which is a chance to have public comments. So at this time, I am looking forward to um, wel welcoming anyone from the community that would like to uh, make a comment at this time. Um, we, uh, I guess I could point out some of the, the guidelines from previous meetings before. Um, the board will not respond to any specific questions or comments that are brought up tonight. We are happy to hear from people in the community. We take copious notes and then we engage on these in future conversations as needed. Um, so if anybody would like to address the board, you can come forward. Please state your name, your address, and limit your comments to three minutes. You could just give them to Val. She'll pass them out. Yes, thanks. My name's Carol, and I live in Plainfield Township. The Epic Times, Olive Tree Ministries, Behold Israel with Amir Sarfati, Hope for Our Times, American Family Radio 91.7 FM, J.D. Farag, Calvary Chapel, Jack Hibbs, Calvary Chapel, Breitbart, Breitbart News Network, and the Bible. I'm guessing not too many people here are exploring these, sor these sources. My question is, why not? In order to do a thorough investigation, research of several sources is necessary, not just one and two. Common sense, right? This past year's events have been disturbing enough that we should all have questions. Listening to only a few stations or reading social media posts is not research. I don't know the people on the board here, and I don't know what you believe. But what's happening worldwide is lining up perfectly with what the Bible says. So if you are a board member who is promoting CRT, pornography, or gender confusion in children, you should be worried. You should be very concerned. If you have even an inkling that God exists or the Bible is true, you should be thinking seriously about what you are promoting. God will hold you accountable. But thankfully, God forgives us all, regardless of our differences. He made us all, black, brown, and white. The agenda that is being pushed in our schools and around this country is evil. We need God back in our lives and in our schools. For this reason, I ask that anyone who wants to,
Please pray with me and let's ask God for forgiveness and courage to stand for what's right. Heavenly Father, I pray for the school board. I pray for all of us here. We all need you. We need your forgiveness and we need your strength and we need your wisdom. Please, Lord, bring your Holy Spirit upon us all tonight. Soften the hearts of everyone here and show us the love of your son, Jesus. I pray for our children and our grandchildren, families and friends, and everyone who is being affected by the changes taking place in our nation today. Give them all strength and courage to do what's right. Give them patience to endure this struggle and not give up. Protect the children in this country and around the world from forced ideologies and evil enticements. Lord, show our teachers the truth. Guide them as they teach the children in their classrooms. Lead them to, to teach real history rather than fabricated information that has been handed to them from above. We pray for our leaders and our government. I ask that you break the hearts of all who are determined to do evil to people of this land. Bring them to repentance and salvation. And if there are any who will not repent and will continue doing evil, confuse them, put obstacles in their way, and turn them on one another. Lord, we pray for all in our country to have their eyes opened, expose the evil around us, and reveal the truth. We ask for your protection and guidance as we go forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks. My name is Doug Lee, and I'm a resident here in Forest Hills, and I have four alumni children. It is fitting to talk about race in a national holiday celebrating Martin Luther King Jr., who gave his life fighting for equality and holding true the principles that a person is not defined by the color of their skin, but by their character. In the spirit of consistency by this board and superintendent Bean, you should ban MLK Day, because this board and superintendent Bean promotes the teachings of CRT in our district. By not, it shows your hypocrisy. The fundamental principles of CRT is dividing a person by its color of skin, exactly opposite of Martin Luther King. So how did we get this ide ideology deep within Forest Hills? You replace fear with common sense and following our superintendent and others down a path by not asking critical questions and demanding real answers. Has anyone demanded from the superintendent Dean an actual example of systematic racism in our, for, in our district? Has anybody done an independent study within our district to see the depth of systematic racism? Has any one of you brought such proof to, this, to the people and community of systemic racism in our community? The answer is no. I heard last week Dan's being deep support and commitment to CRT. The Board of Education is elected by the community and needs to represent the community and our kids and not the narrow focus of Superintendent Bean. Your job is to ask questions and find solutions. So far, the Board of Education has divided this community. By asking questions and demanding answers, it does not show your weakness, but defines your wisdom. I ask each of you into the future. I ask each of you to look into the future at Forest Hills and view how this ends. Do you think we will give up the promoting that white people are evil? I promise you, Dan, we will change the Board of Education's makeup and you will remove the superintendent. I ask the Board of Education to ban CRT from our schools and replace our superintendent with a person of vision and unity. Why am I here? I have four kids. I have two daughters that are emotionally damaged by CRT. I've had two attempted suicides with one daughter. My passion runs deep for our kids, and my kids as well. I can share with you the damage that CRT does, and you guys haven't experienced it yet because most of your kids haven't graduated, but mine have. If you continue down this path, you will be like me. You will find that your parent, your, ki your own kids, will have divisions that do not meet what your values are. So carefully think about what you do. Thank you. Anna 
Angela at East Beltline. Um, I had no intentions of speaking tonight, so I don't have anything prepared. I will say I did not have any clue if you guys were paid or not. So knowing that you're not paid surprises me any more, even more that you guys are so attached to these masks. What are you getting out of it? I don't understand that you want to keep these masks on our youngest of children that are least at risk. It makes no sense whatsoever. I just really wish you would think about my son luckily is grown now, but he had speech issue. If he would have been in school as a young child right now, with masks covering everybody's face, he couldn't do it. He would not learn how to talk. I just can't understand why you would be doing this to our youngest of children. We need to see those children's beautiful smiling faces. Those children need to see each other's smiling faces and also the teachers and hear them. Just please think about our children. Hi, my name is Carol Vancouvering. I'm from Plainfield Township. <clears throat> School board. When Hillary Clinton coined the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, what she really was saying is that we want the government to raise your children, and they are succeeding far above their wildest dreams. In 1992, Curtis Bowers wrote on the evil coming to the US, the naked communist subverting America. With these points in mind, he stated, eliminate prayer in schools, claiming it violates separation of church and state. Discredit the family as an institution. Encourage promiscuity and easy divorce. Get control of teacher associations. Use them as transmission belts for socialism. Soften the curriculum. Get control of teachers' unions. Eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling it censorship and violation of free speech. Break down moral standards, promote pornography in books, magazines, movies, and TV. Present homosexuality, deviant sex as normal, natural, and healthy. Infiltrate the press, gun control, and key positions in radio, TV, and movies. Infiltrate churches, replace revealed religion with social religion. Discredit the Bible. Bertram Russell quoted, turn schools on their heads, make everything evil, have social rot, make the West so corrupt it stinks. This is where we are. So we get on our feet, understanding what is going on now. We pray, we can't stay silent no matter what we have, an obligation to tell the truth. With this said, I would like to now pray. Lord God, we ask your forgiveness for allowing our country to come to this ungodly state of decay and not being aware of where our educational systems were and are bringing our children to. They are being harmed mentally, sometimes physically, and definitely emotionally. We must do better than this. Please, Lord God, I pray for these school board members to examine their hearts and really think about what they are approving and why, if we claim to care about children, we as a body can work together to bring our educational system back under the influence of the God, of God, the way our founders and forefathers intended. In Jesus' name, I pray this, amen. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Micah Perkins, and I live in Grand Rapids, but I'm also a representative of the Michigan Building Trades. Um, I am not a public health expert, and I am not an education expert, but I do want to say I do not envy your guys' jobs. Um, I'm a plumber, and that's as complicated as I want to get. 
The reason I'm here tonight is um, I was recently appointed to this position, which is a representative of all the skilled trades in West and Southwest Michigan. I represent an area roughly from Manistee down to the state line and a little bit west of Lansing to the lakeshore. Um, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, so on and so forth. I'm trying to get around to all the school boards in the areas that I represent because, and I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know, but the trades are aging out. Um, average construction age on a site is in their early 50s. It's just not a sustainable way of doing business. So what we're going around literally hat in our hand and asking is can we come talk to your kids? Because we need to get in front of people who want a successful career in the construction industry. We offer second to none retirement, second to none health care, paid training. They will get done with their apprenticeships and have no debt and they will in many cases make well into the six figures on their first year as a journeyman, whatever it is. So the benefits we offer are excellent. What we are terrible at is educating of people about those things. We're really good at building things, we're not so good at telling people about the building of things. Um, and so I'm here in a ch an effort to stem that tide because we really need the help. So if you're interested in what I'm offering, which I hope you will be because obviously we all know that skilled trades are in demand right now and hope to have some conversations with you. I appreciate your time, thank you. I'm Katie Gray. I have three kids in the Forest Hills District. I believe that the district's mask mandate in schools is misguided and harmful. You've already heard our arguments and I won't belabor them, but in short, by every known measure, children appear to tolerate this virus very well. What is not known is the extent of the unintended consequences from the district's mandate. Early childhood is a crucial period when humans develop cultural, language, and social skills, including the ability to detect emotion on faces. While common sense tells us that this is harmful, we do not yet know the long-term effect that this will have on our children. To quote the U.S. government's National Institutes of Health, it is unclear how mask wearing behavior and mask mandates influence cognitive and social development. The CDC still persists in recommending compulsory masking of children in school, but the primary study the CDC cites to support that unconventional recommendation was recently described as profoundly misleading in an article published just last month in The Atlantic, of all places. In the words of one scientist quoted in the article, the data is so unreliable that it probably should not have been entered into the public discourse. The CDC is the outlier. Even the WHO, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, and the UK all recommend using masks only for older children, which is further described as age 12 and up. Last Friday, the CDC once again changed its stance on masks, acknowledging what many of us have believed to be true from the start, that the cloth masks worn by children and adults do not offer as much protection as we've been told. I submit that it's time to finally recognize that the mask mandate's negligible benefits do not outweigh the very real for potential for long-term educational and psychological harm to children. We've put masks on our children's and teachers' faces during nearly every moment of educational instruction for the last two years and counting. This is imprudent and short-sighted, and it needs to end. I'm asking you tonight to follow other districts in the country, including school districts right here in West Michigan, and giving parents the choice to unmask your children. Unmask my children. It's time to do something different and put kids first, and let's make the change. Hello, my name is Jarrett Jakubowski. My wife and I have lived in the district in Grand Rapids Township for over 30 years. And uh, we have a question for the board and Mr. Beam. Is your commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity, core goals of CRT, divisive, racist, and destructive? If you chose to answer our questions, I'm sure you would be head-shaking denial Oh no, you'd say. Our intentions are the opposite of such evil. 
Well, allow me to show you how your intentions are at odds with real world effects. In our neighborhood, there are a half a dozen kids going off to middle school when the buses are running. They are of very diverse families, mixed race, black and Hispanic kids, all born of white mothers, daughters of our white neighbors. The parents and grandparents of their diverse families wish they had known about the recent recall petition. They all would have signed on. Why? Well, because of their children's taunts and accusations. They have been declaring, Mom, you're a racist. Grandpa, you're a racist. Grandma, you're a racist. And get this, they all, all these very impressionable kids of color, also bully their own half-siblings and call them racist too. Why? Because some are guilty of having lighter complexions. And the lighter, whiter they are, the more guilty they are. Of course, they've been asked, where did you get these ideas? We are racist. Who's telling you these terrible things? And they all, in several grades, answer matter-of-factly, at school, by our teachers, at school, by our teachers, at school, by our teachers. <sighs> and I lost my other page. Anyway, um, I, I, I am, excuse me, while I go back to my notes, I do apologize. Anyway, dear friends, I am sure such sad sickness is not isolated to only one neighborhood. It's not quarantined to just one or two classrooms. Oh, no. This is a microcosm of a much bigger problem, a true pandemic. So who are the vector spreaders? Well, that was made clear in the superintendent's online Leonard letter of June 2020, which was probably seen almost exclusively by just the board and our district teachers. Therein, it officially declared our district and culture rife with systemic racism, and it explicitly attributed racism's origin and continuance exclusively to whites. And there was a litany of directives and recommended resources all in sync with CRT dogma. You need to wrap up now, thanks. Uh, you, Thank 10 you. seconds. So here we are on Martin Luther King Day, sincerely asking who was responsible for dividing people, even families, into the oppressed and the oppressors? Who was responsible for teaching our children to judge and thanks, condemn Jared. others based on it. the color thanks. of their skin rather than the content Thank you. of their character. Thank you. This past weekend, a group of us tried to organize. I'm sorry, a could you say your name one more time? I don't know if she got me anyway. Yep. Uh, this past weekend, a group of us tried to organize a community gathering for us to fully show the transportation staff how much we appreciate and support them. It was clear that the administration was not happy about this meeting. This gathering was for all of the community and the transportation staff. Many drivers, unfortunately, didn't feel comfortable enough due to concerns that they may lose their job if they showed up. Shame on the admins for making them feel that way. And shame on admin for not joining us in this meeting to talk to them openly. Shame on us as a community for not going out and trying this previously. We've learned so much from that transportation department, the leadership roles and support that they get or don't get, and why these drivers do what they do. Driving is not an easy job. I don't know many that could handle sitting behind that, that driver's seat and handling the amount of kids that they handle. Same with teachers. We all want the shortage of drivers to be over with, so why can't we all come together and brainstorm to help alleviate the issues? Our drivers have a personal investment in their jobs. They have built personal relationships with the kids and many of the families. 
They go the extra mile by following up with kids when they get hurt or just to make sure that everything's okay if a parent doesn't show up at the stop. You say that you want to fix the problem and most importantly, get the parents to stop complaining, then let's brainstorm together. Do you believe anyone on the wages provided to those staff members can truly afford to support their family? We need to be competitive. We need to pay fair wages. And we need to be having a compensation package to entice new staff and to retain staff. If we don't do something soon, the shortage for drivers will be increased even more. Several of these drivers are already re retired and will want to quit and enjoy time on their own. Please take the time to sit and listen to your current staff. They have great ideas that could help bring in more candidates. Involve the community. Show your support. Be their voice because they don't have proper channels to communicate with the public. I encourage everyone in this room to take 30 seconds to leave a note of encouragement for the transportation department. I brought index cards so that, and I will place them back in the back by the, the flowers, just so that they know the appreciation, the support, and to know that we are there for them and support them. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Shelley Petrowski. I live in Cascade Township. Um, and I was at the same meeting that uh, Mandy just referenced with the bus drivers. Because we decided to get together and really just show our uh, appreciation and our support to them in an informal breakfast, right? So over that breakfast, um, we each as parents just took a moment to just tell them how much we thank them and how much we value the role that they play in the safety of our children and the overall you know, experience of transportation for this community. Um, so while we were drinking coffee and eating breakfast treats, we asked them to like, hey, what can we do to support you? Because the last thing we want to do is do something that's right, uh, you know, not going to help. Um, and this evolved into a three hour conversation that we had to like close down because we could have kept on going. It was um, positive, it was productive, it was inspiring. It, I'm shaking actually because it motivated me to stand in front of you all to show my support and my gratitude to these drivers. So we did acknowledge the nationwide problem, right, uh, in our discussion that has been cited repeatedly as the sole reason. Um, but I find it curious, right, that no other district in Kent County has chronic long-standing bus cancellations that we have had. I invite you to prove me wrong. I personally researched 20 or so other districts in Kent County that offer busing. I could find two other schools that each canceled a route for like a day or two. Compare that to the 259, 259 routes and counting that have been canceled since the start of this year. I invite you to prove me wrong. The bus drivers are often the first district employee to greet our children in the morning and the last person to bid them farewell at the end of the day. I know all of our, our all of us parents value them deeply. My current impression is that the district does not value them. I invite you to prove me wrong. Many of us moved into this district because it used to be one of the best. We should be the benchmark for other districts, including transportation. So why didn't we have a signed contract before the start of the school year? I firmly believe that the reason we cannot hire or retain bus drivers is due to your woefully uncompetitive compensation packet. I invite you to prove me wrong. I would submit to you it's not my responsibility to spend time researching comparative facts that prove to you our district is the worst public school transportation problem in Kent County, perhaps all of Michigan, heck, I don't know, maybe in the nation. You're, you are the stewards of 115 to $120 million in taxpayers' money. I implore you to do three simple things. Gather the facts, analyze the problem, and solve it. That's what leaders do. They take accountability, they drive action, and they deliver results. This is not personal, it's about performance. I believe in this district. I believe the busing problems must be fixed. I invite you to prove me right. Thank you. Hello, my name's Mike Loikes. 
live here in Ada and uh, four children that go to the through the district. So first of all, I do want to thank you for your volunteer efforts as a school board. It is appreciated. I know there's a lot of challenging things that come your way, but I do want to mention that. <clears throat> but what I'm going to bring up again is important. So in December, I brought up the 2201 board powers and general powers that were approved. There was an, uh, an adjustment made or a new power granted, and this is on the website, uh, and it's number six on the list of, again, series 2000 bylaws, if anyone wants to look it up. As a reminder, that bylaw change says this, the board delegates to the superintendent the authority to take action in circumstances not authorized by the board action or policy when required to effectively maintain the district's day-to-day -day operations. The superintendent should A, promptly inform the board action of the action taken and the need for the taking the expected action, and B, report the action to the board at the board's first meeting after the superintendent takes such action. I have a couple questions related to that. So I looked it up, looks like the district's been around for 65 years. And I'll just reference decades right now. So after all these decades, why this conferred power number six? Why is it needed after all these decades of running? We've heard it, successful, great school district. It's a very important question. What are the examples of why this had to happen? I'd really like to understand that because the way it's described feels a bit broad to me. I'm just not an expertise in that type of writing. And when this was approved by the Board of Education, why? I'd like to know the logic of each person that said, yes, we're going to do this power change after decades, decades of, I don't think it was there. And the other question is, what's not possible without this? In other words, what was not happening? What really drove this change? Specific examples are important to me, and I'm sure others. And lastly, who proposed this chain change? Was it the board? Dan, was it you? Is it something that's a trend that's happening? These are honest questions I'd like answered because this was approved in December, and I'd simply like to know these. So I will do a follow-up email. Thank you. My name is Kay. I do not live in your district, but I have nieces and nephews and friends who have children that go to your schools, and I promised I would come in support of them. Firstly, it's about the masks. I echo what everybody else has been saying. It's cruel to the children. It's not necessary, and as has been now, it's okay to say out loud that they don't look. The other thing that I would like to address is also the CRT issue that this gentleman brought up. It is evil. It is horrible that you are teaching, and you amongst many, many school districts, that are teaching the children to hate, to look at each other with, instead of what's inside, it's what's outside. And I have grandchildren that are of color. Now, they're not in school yet. They will be in your school district unless I can, you know, get my uh, kids to move to a different district. What are they going to do? They're going to look at their father, who is white, call him a racist, the mother, who is of color, call her a victim, and look at me, grandma, that I'm horrible. You people need to stop. You need to stop this. It is wrong, and I think all of you know deep down in your heart that it is. So I also know that you get millions and millions of dollars from the federal government, from the state government. And I think you need to be very, very open and transparent to all of the people in your district as to what strings come with those dollars. They, they definitely come with strings attached to them. And I, I understand you have the opportunity to lift this mask mandate in a matter of a week or so. Please do. Please do. Stop the cruelty to the children and do the right thing. 
थैंक यू My name is Stephanie Boone. Um, in July of 1953, Martin Luther King Jr. gave a sermon in Atlanta where he warned listeners about the negative ways money can impact society and their individual lives. Money in its proper place is a worthwhile and necessary instrument for a well-rounded life, but when it is projected to the status of a god, it becomes a power that corrupts and an instrument of exploitation. When men arrive at the point of making money a god, they become more concerned with what they can get out of society than with what they can give to society in terms of service. When men bow down and worship at the shrine of money, they are being deprived of their most precious endowment, the possibility of living life in its fullest and its endless beauty. That was Martin Luther King Jr. I know you're all working feverishly to put together the district's plan, for the use of millions of dollars in ESSER III American Rescue Plan federal and state equalization funding made possible by the Biden administration. And I know that you're reaching out to stakeholders to find out what their best idea is as ways to use that money. And I'm a stakeholder, and I would like you to understand that one of the ways to use that money is to not use it. You don't have to take it. It's optional. I, I want to make sure that as a board you understand that it is optional. Um, and that as a condition of acceptance of these optional taxpayer dollars that Forest Hills really hasn't shown a need for, you are agreeing that in addition to agreeing to requirements for virus mandates, which were sneakily slipped into the state's plan for this money submitted last year, without the opportunity for public comment or input, also, over half of it is required to be spent on measurable efforts to, in essence, divide our children based on the color of their skin, as well as pointing out their other differences and treating them differently because of it. And we know, just last week, the Michigan State Board of Education passed a resolution that couldn't make it more obvious that they are just fine with critical race theory being taught in our schools. They voted down on a bill that would have banned it. Um, you know, we have FOIA'd, you all claim it's not going on in our schools. Well, we have over 400,000 results saying otherwise. It is in our schools, and it's not okay. And you can stop taking money, turn it down, and stand up for our kids. Do you ever think about that? In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I do thank all of you for your volunteer time and your efforts. But if we ever want to get back to the days where Martin Luther King's words are true and were true again, stop selling out to the government and start standing up for what's right for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, I'm, my name is Scott. I'm also here to touch base on the money aspect. Um, I don't know if anyone else is familiar with the way the local governments and municipalities and their board books work. Uh, just for instance, Cascade's most recent uh, uh, meeting packet was 262 pages long. 70 of those pages dealt with the finances and the checks that were going out. And this is just for, uh, it was for the month of November. 70 pages of that. You guys are authorizing spending $13.5 million tonight. $3.4 million in checks, $4.4 million in ACH and wire transfers, and then the rest is $5.5 million for uh, employees and stuff. One of the checks you guys are approving is this right here that I got last month. So thank you for that. It was actually a refund for a uh, thing my child didn't want to do. My question is, why can't they be more detailed? So we know what the money is being spent on each month. So we can go back to see who it's getting it, either these uh, different consultants or whatnot, uh, 
I know once a year you guys print out the check register. You just did it recently. I believe it was 215 pages long. But is there any way that we can find out where the ACH and wire transfers are going? Because that was actually more money than the checks. So just like what Ms. Boone referenced in regards to the money, we want to know where our tax money are going. If it's going to, you know, critical race theory uh, programs or consultants or, or what have you, I'd just like to know so we can do our research. So then perhaps it won't end up like what happened in Grand Haven where $900,000 was embezzled over seven years. Or you can Google school board or school embezzlement. It happens all over the place. There was a great film on uh, HBO with Hugh Jackman called Bad Education, where it was a uh, district a lot like this. It took place in New York where a superintendent, not to throw you under the bus stand or anything, but they embezzled millions of dollars from the school district. It happens everywhere. Not saying it couldn't happen here or not saying that it is happening here, but just having more eyes looking at it as opposed to you guys authorizing spending $13 million with just two pages of finance records. I just think it should just be a little bit more transparent. And if you look at, like I said, the local municipalities, they all show it. They're all their uh, meeting packets are s sometimes several hundred pages long. And if you guys print out all yours, it's maybe you know anywhere from 10 to 30. So thank you. Hi, Vince Manahar. Uh, I just wanted to follow up for uh, what Mrs. Boone had uh, recently talked about, about this resolution uh, by the Michigan uh, Department of Education, and read the actual bill that they are against, and this is Senate Bill Number 460. I'll read as much as I can. The people of the state of Michigan enact Section 1167, Number 1, notwithstanding any other provision of law under this act to be contrary, beginning with the 2021-2022 school year, the school board excuse me, the Board of School District or the Board of Directors of a public school academy shall ensure that the curriculum provided to all pupils enrolled in the school district or public school academy does not include coverage of critical race theory, the 1619 Project, or any of the following anti-American and racist theories. A, that any race is inherently superior or inferior to any other race. B, that the United States is a fundamentally racist country. C, that the Declaration of Independence or the United States Constitution are fundamentally racist documents. D, that an individual's moral character of worth is determined by his or her race. E, that an individual by virtue of his or her race is inherently racist or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. This is what they are against. Number two, by not later than September 30th, 2021, and by not later than September 30th of the year thereafter, the department shall determine each school district and public school academy that is in violation of the subsection one and shall withhold 5% of total funds to the school district or public school academy under the State School Aid Act of 1979, MCL, a bunch of string of numbers. Number three, by not later than November 1st, 2021, and not later than November 1st of every year thereafter, the department shall submit a report to the House and Senate Standing Committee responsible for education legislation that includes both of the following. A, a list of all school districts and public school academies that were in non-compliance with this section for immediately preceding school year. B, a breakdown of the school districts and public school academies that had their funding withheld under subsection two. Four, the school district or public school academy shall not direct or otherwise compel pupils to personally affirm, adopt, or adhere to any of the following tenets. A, that any sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin is inherently superior or inferior. B, that individuals should be adversely treated on the basis of their sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin. C, that individuals by virtue of sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin are inherently responsible for actions committed in the past by other members of the same sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, or national origin. Five, as used in this section, 1619 Project means an initiative of the New York Times that attempts to reframe American history by regarding 1619 as America's birth year. This includes curriculum regarding guides, lesson plans, activities, guided discussions, and other resources developed by the Pulitzer Center on critical uh, report, excuse me, crisis reporting based on the initiative described in the subdivision. There's a little bit more left, but I'll end here saying I don't really see what the problem with this is and why the Board of Education took a stand against this. Thank 
Are there any other comments? All right, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, oh, Warren, okay. All right. Uh, my name is Robert Enox, and um, I'm looking around the room. This is my first time here tonight, and I can see that the majority of people do not have masks on, and so that kind of tells me that I think it's pretty obvious that a lot of the, I mean, I know you guys are busy and you don't really have time to investigate each and every little thing about, oh, they work, oh, they don't work, and this, that, and the other. But a lot of the community here that do have the time to look into that kind of stuff and vet that information and see what's accurate and what isn't. And so when it looks like the majority of the room is telling you that these things don't work and they're hurting the kids, I, I think it's pretty obvious I mean, what we should do about that. So um, anyway, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and I don't want, um, you know, there's been so many people speaking tonight, it's hard for me to keep up with what all was actually said, and everything I heard was powerful. And I'm feeling like there's been so many people speak that a lot of what was said was just, well, just sweep it under the rug, and nobody really cares, but I hope you really did take notes and can actually, you know, affect some change that the community would like to see. Thank you. Good evening, Paul Laidler. My wife Lisa and I have uh, four daughters in the district. I've spoken a few times here this year. Wow, what a night. Um, <clears throat> I had penned something to read specifically and, and it never seems to go the way that I think it will. Um, and I was moved here tonight. I think the spirit is moving many of us in the room. Um, I came here tonight to detail MCL 380.10 and the rights uh, the lawful rights of parents and guardians to uh, direct the care and teaching and education of their children. Um, but I think there's a more important message um, that's, that's come to light here, um, particularly tonight on CRT and DEI and um, those initiatives and the dollars that um, chase those ideologies. Um, I came to speak to you to hopefully affect change. I came with a pretty negative mindset, thinking that um, we we're nearing the end of the road and that I was going to give up on um, the systems that are currently in place and the machinations that exist in these seats of uh, invalid authority by some people's standards. But um, I think I can make change a different way, in a more positive light. With that said, I'd like to talk to the people. Um, this is an incredible pa group. Wow, Paul, looking at it this way. This I, is I, the public comments for the Board of Education, right. so you need to direct your comments to, you, to I'm us. I'm speaking to you as well. This is also a message for you. Right. It, it, the comments are directed towards the board, Paul. They if are, you want to continue your, I just your time to have with some us, eye we'd, love to, okay. we'd love to hear sure. from you. Thank you. Well, just briefly, um, today, this holiday, Dr. King's celebration, um, moved some folks here tonight, like I said, and moved me. And I was reminded of where my wife and four daughters were on April 4th, 2018. Um, we were in Memphis, and we were standing on the balcony at the Lorraine Motel, and we toured the Civil Rights Museum. We took that opportunity to teach our children because it's our responsibility. It's not yours. It's not. It's the communities. It's the families. It's the organizations out there like churches, synagogues, and the like to master this subject. It's not your job. It's about the money, and I wish you would stop. Give it back, turn it back, and engage us. Engage us. Let us do the teaching. It's our responsibility. It's not in the charter. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any other public comments? Yeah, I'll go. Okay.
concerned citizen. Uh, you know, I liked it when Paul turned his back to you because I don't think he should be the only one that's subjected to people talking out of their <laughs> <laughs> So look, I know my rights. I don't know the laws very well. So I'm trying to learn. So I would tell you, first and foremost, our rights are inherent in we the people. You guys serve at our pleasure. Um, it's clear to us that the state constitution in Article 8 of Section 1 places relig uh, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to the good movement and happiness of mankind. Schools and a means of education shall forever be encouraged. I don't think that the educational opportunities here are being encouraged much. Um, then let's drill down. Paul mentioned uh, the Revised School Code, Act 451, uh, Section 380.10. The rights of parents and legal guardians and the duties of public schools. It is the natural, fundamental right of parents and legal guardians to determine and direct the care, teaching, and education of their children. Now let's come down one step further and say, uh, the school districts are granted powers under the Revised School Code, Act 451 of 1976, Section 380.11a, number three, Section B, providing for the safety and welfare of pupils at school or at a school-sponsored activity. So when you roll all those things together, it's clear what takes precedence. The fundamental rights, the foundational rights of a parent to be involved, direct, and lead the health and welfare of their child while they are turned over to you to receive an education. So I thought to myself, man, there is not gonna be any school district foolish enough to extend the mask mandate after it expires from the, from the health department, the Kent County Health Department. And lo and behold, I was proved wrong <laughs> right here in Forest Hills. So in an MLive article uh, that was published on December 30th, uh, Superintendent Beam said, the mask mandate will help keep more students and staff in the classroom this winter. He said face coverings will help mitigate a surge in cases following the winter break. So you're not a health official, you're not serving in the capacity of a health official, and yet you feel compelled to dispense your knowledge and wisdom and make choices for our families that we don't agree with. How is that possible? And are you telling me now that you are taking on the burden of a public health official and that you, while not being indemnified, are going to mandate to us what masks should and should not be worn in the school? It's, the writing is clear on the wall. If you do a Google search, and Google is not my search engine of choice, it will tell you that Stanford, University of Southern California, Thank you. You can wrap up now. I will Mr. wrap up. Concerned again citizens. and again and again, it indicates you that you, your second Thank and you. third graders are already 30% behind okay. in their reading and development than they should have been. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Heather Campbell, Grand Rapids. This is a lot for me to come up here, but I've noticed that we have been ridiculed for not speaking our side tonight. I just want to thank the board for everything they're doing and to continue doing it. The thing I want to say is that the God they want in the classroom is not my God. It's not a lot of people's God. So I wish that they would stop talking about their God. Public school was put into place to raise public citizens. Love is love and not pornography. There aren't a lot of masks in the room tonight because they don't want to be around COVID spreaders. So thank you very much for doing your job. Thank you for listening to science and take care. Science. <laughs> Hi, um, before you start the clock, I was just gonna ask for a little professional courtesy. I have a, a audio tape on here that's three minutes and six seconds. If there's any chance you just start the clock, maybe six seconds in, so I can get through it, if that's possible. And if it doesn't produce well, I'll, I'll walk away and get a better one next time. I just wanted you to listen to this. Thank you.
Just a quick you, point. Could you state your name, please? Yes, my name's Tom Antor. I'm a county commissioner. I appreciate the time. Thanks. Just one quick thing. That was Paul Harvey from the 1960s over at National Radio yeah. Show. The man was a prophet, and I hope you listened to that and understood what he's saying. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nick Prill. Um, I, uh, I couldn't say anything better than what's already been said tonight. Um, so a couple things I would like to point out. Um, the flag etiquette, uh, the United States flag always belongs on the left. I appreciate that you guys do the Pledge of Allegiance and have the flags in here. I would hope that that can be fixed for the next meeting. Um, also, uh, Ms. President, um, I welcome you to your new seat. Um, and I will say, I really hope that you familiarize yourself with the Michigan Open Meetings Act. The First Amendment right that is protected at this podium because of the fact that this is a limited public forum. You trying to censor Paul earlier is a direct violation of his First Amendment right. The Supreme Court has already ruled on it. There's case law that supports it. You guys are elected officials. I appreciate that you volunteer and you're not paid but you're subject to your oaths of office that you all had to take, and that is to uphold the United States and the Michigan Constitution. COVID did not suspend the Constitution. You will no longer violate our rights. We will not stand for it. There's a whole slew of people that are running for school board, and when they get elected, that what they're gonna do on day one is to terminate Dan Beam's contract for, for him dividing this community at every step of the way. And I will support them 100%. So Dan, if you have future career ambitions, I think you should step down before you're fired. Thank you. My name's Emily. Sorry for going over your time. I'm sure this is a long meeting, but anyway, um, I'm a member of the community. I am also an employee. I drive school bus for Forest Hills. I drive a lot of your kids. <laughs> this, is a this is a tough gig to be in, okay? I, I, we hear a lot of the talking about transportation were used as a point of contention sometimes, and it's exhausting. But anyway, we still show up every day and we truly care about the kids and it's a very tough job. Our time is condensed into a short amount of time and it's honestly very few people could do that job. Well, they think they could, but once they're in that seat, they're like, oh, there's just so many things. But anyway, we do care about your kids immensely. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. Um, and in the spirit of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., he would not have stood for racist beliefs embodied in CRT or whatever it's called, diversity, equity, inclusion. I just, I really want my child to go to Forest Hills. I did not send her this year. She's kindergarten age. I could not put a mask on her face. After working at Forest Hills, I saw what it was doing to the younger age children and it was, I'm just, it made my decision for me. But I'm hoping next year she can go. Um, CRT, which seeks to segregate our society by ensuring oppressed classes. Rather, Reverend King, he was a true patriot. And as he once wrote, his dream was deeply rooted in the American dream. King supported a society that celebrates the content of one's character over the color of one's skin. But that does not mean society is colorblind. He held that a truly patriotic belief united all Americans regardless of the ethnicity or skin color. Understanding that we are all members of one human race. This belief is in direct contravention to what CRT proponents espouse. Again, there's one human race. I hear races all the time, but I, I, there's only one human race. We share over 99.9% .9 of the same DNA, all of us, every single human. We are more alike than we are different. 
We are one blood, we are one human race. There is no white race, black race, no red race, no brown race, no yellow race, no mixed race. There's only one critical race, and that is the human race, and it's not a theory, it's a fact. We must all learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we will perish together as fools. Martin Luther King also said that. But anyway, in the spirit of him, I spoke, and thank you for listening. Robert, um, I went home because I found something in my kid's drawer that says unity. And to me, that's what a school board is supposed to do, is make unity among all of us. That's really been lacking. When you have on this shirt shows all these different kids, unity. This was 2017. Here we are all fighting about one issue. The big issue is CRT and the races. How would you feel as a parent to know that your son or your daughter is not good as somebody else? Or that person over there is going to be held down because we've got to help this one out. When most kids today are much better than the kids when we were younger. They get along better, they do things better, but what are we doing as parents and adults? We're making it so all of a sudden now it's back to what it was in the 50s. It's not right, people. Unity can be done. That's what a school board's job is, create unity. If you have this many people upset, then we got a problem. You need to find a balance. Same with the, the buses. What's the first thing a, a person or a business needs to have is transportation. What's the biggest problem in this country today? We can't get the goods to the stores. Kids need to get to the schools. The bus driver is the first person the kid sees and the last person that the kid sees when he goes home. We need to take care of our bus drivers. We need to fill their positions. That's unity. That's what a board is supposed to do. That's what a business is supposed to do. This is a business. Thank you. All right, are there any other comments for the evening? I just wanted to say that. Um, Could you state your full name, please, for the um, minutes? Casey. Casey, your last name. Uh, Born. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that um, we're not going to be silenced speaking about our God. And just like every, everyone else can speak about their God, um, we're not going to be silenced. I've been silenced in my own school, in a public school, for praying with a, another classmate. And I'm standing right here saying, I don't appreciate that. Um, every religion has freedom of speech, and you all should respect that, and everyone should. And as soon as we get far away from that, then the freedom of speech starts to go down and freedom of religion. So I just wanted to say that um, and the masks. I know I've heard talk of the masks um, being eliminated soon, and I just want to say I, to urge you guys to keep in that. Um, stand up for the freedom to choose to wear a mask. We know the masks don't work, um, and wearing them all day long in an environment for two years now is not gonna work. Um, it's not working. People are dying. It's not working. And um, I just wanted to say that, and that we need freedom back in America. And it starts in the education, and you guys, it's your jobs to keep that up. Freedom, freedom, freedom freedom of speech, freedom to choose, freedom to make our own choices. And that's it. Okay, any other comments for the evening? All right, well with that, um, th no, uh, it's one time. Maybe, you can come back in February, thanks. You, you can come back in February, yet yeah, one time. It, 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 it does, it's one time, thanks. You can co come back in February. Val can let you know where we'll be. We do, we do, thank you. 
All right, so are there any other comments? We'll move on then. Um, thank you for your comments. Uh, one of the things I mentioned at the outset of this is we appreciate the public sharing comments with us. Um, they inform future conversations that we're having as the board in support of the work that Dan and his team are doing in the district. Thank you for coming out and supporting. Um, at this time, I think we're gonna move on to some of our uh, regular items, which would be to move into budget and other regular business here. So let's move on into the consent grouping. I would like a motion to, well, I actually, well, yeah. I need a motion to approve this. I'll make a motion to approve the consent grouping. Is it A, a B, C, right? Yeah. 7 a, 7 a, A through D. A through D, thank yeah. you. Do we have yeah. a second? Excellent. All right. At this time, uh, Superintendent Beam, are there any items you'd like to bring out for our consideration? Simply that we are recommending the employment of two new professional staff members to serve as teachers in the district at Central High, Eastern Middle, and Eastern High. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to go to Mrs. Gregory to give us an update from the Finance Committee. Yep. Right thank now, you. we are 50% through the fiscal year and 35% of the school year. Um, the action items we need approved. I'm going to talk about the kids reading program, which Ms. Atwater is going to talk about more. Um, but it's a great program where we engage our students um, to bring home uh, books during the summer time. And um, we need funding not to exceed $115,000 um, approval, excuse me, uh, from the Esther, fund, Esther 2 stabilization funding um, this will come from. And then we also need approval for to ready our utility poles that have been damaged, um, fiber optic lines uh, to connect our district. This is $88,000 from our general fund from, uh, that goes to consumers energy. And the last action item is property tax reimbursement for $33,000 to Ada Township. Um, Mr. Beam will talk more about our ESSER updates, I am sure. Um, but he is doing a lot of work in that area and very thankful for that. We have some construction updates, not as many as we normally have, but if you go to our homepage, <clears throat> excuse me, on the Forest Hills um, homepage, right-hand side, nice little image, you can go there, uh, blogs and videos of the newest updates going on. So that is it. Great, thank you for that. Mrs. Atwater, would you like to update us on curriculum highlights? Thanks. Happily. So we had our, our monthly meeting last week as well. Um, began with Julie's report, uh, updating us on what Nicole had just uh, summarized for us. Our instruction update. Uh, Susan started by giving us a tech update, actually. It's very exciting that last week we received 2,000 new Chromebooks. Uh, these came through an application to the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Uh, these will help fill a very easy gap uh, with students, and they will be able to check these out. Uh, the tech department is now working hard to uh, determine distribution, distribution of those Chromebooks. Uh, Tamasha gave us a brief update uh, on educational equity and inclusion, and congratulations are in order for her. She has been accepted to a program at Michigan State University um, for a DEI cohort of K-12 uh, practitioners who will share ideas, best practices. Um, this could help move along. Um, it's a great learning opportunity, and, and I applaud her work in applying to that, and I'm very pleased. Uh, also, following up on the opportunity for the board to examine our own cultural competencies, um, we can do an assessment in advance on our own time and then meet either during the day or an evening. I'll uh, reach out to everyone to see if we can find a time uh, that works for everybody at, at the end of May in the evening, because I know daytime doesn't, isn't going to work for everybody. Uh, and then, among other things, conducting the assessment. Um, this can just really help us see our own blind spots. It's not teaching anything. It's not... Uh, forcing anything, it's having us examine, self-examine. Uh, finally, Tamasha noted that the cultural calendar, which uh, previously had been uh, in, handled by the uh, assistant to superintendent, uh, is now something that she will handle, uh, working on the cultural calendar that is distributed throughout the district. And then Christine Yelding uh, reviewed the recommended changes in the 2022-23 high school uh, course description guide. This time it was kind of a non-event because there really is not much change, just one small uh, issue at Eastern High regarding AP Computer Science. Uh, that is a course that it will be available at all three high schools. 
And finally, we did review the recommendation from the Board Finance Committee to extend our existing summer reading program. Uh, this is called Kids Read Now. We have uh, that for all students other than Spanish immersion. There's a separate program where they get books that are published in Spanish. That one goes through Scholastic. Uh, Kids Read Now is a program for K through three st students that we have participated in for a number of years. Students get to self-select nine books. Uh, and this is for reading over the sum summertime to help prevent summer slip um, and other, you know, get kids engaged, keep them engaged, want them to come back into the school year uh, as readers and interested readers. Last year, just in Forest Hills, 18,063 books were delivered to our students. That has a huge impact. Uh, there is a parent reporting com component to this program. And uh, that, doesn't that doesn't impact whether the students receive their books, but it does provide some important data. Um, last year, we had 70% participation of the parents uh, with that component of it. And we'd like to improve that. We hope to get a little bit more. Maybe go to 71, <laughs> as, as came out in our uh, committee meeting, laughingly. Laughingly. You what? You what? Oh, I absolutely read the books. Um, and the parent reporting part just gives us some, some important feedback, and uh, hopefully we can be above 70% this next year. And we know that the kids will be excited to get these things. Uh, our action limits, uh, action items were limited to approving the minutes of our December 15th, 2021 meeting. Uh, and now, having completed our 30-day review, we do recommend uh, tonight approval of uh, three supplemental resources, Skeleton Creek by Patrick Carmen for use at Ada Elementary, the Watsons Go to Birmingham by Christopher Paul Curtis for use at Central Middle School, right here. And Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone uh, by J.K. Rowling for use at the cinema course at Central High School. That concludes my report. Always a great report. Any questions for Nicole or Marty? All right, fantastic. Um, with that, Madam Secretary, we should have a roll call vote. All right, Mrs. Atwater? Yes. Mrs. Gregory? Yes. Dr. Fawzen? Yes. Mrs. Vonk? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Tryon? Yes. Mrs. Cavell? Yes. And Mrs. Callahan? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, I think we're going to roll right into uh, the first superintendent's update of 2022. Take Absolutely. it away. Absolutely. Thank you, Mrs. Callahan. Uh, I would just like to say uh, thank you to the team here at Central Middle School for welcoming us here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Haga. Uh, Mr. Haga is in his first year as principal here in Forest Hills and at Central Middle School. He's been doing a great job. Jeff Simon, our assistant principal, thank you, John and Jeff, for all you do and the great team that we have here at Central Middle School that helps kids every day. So thanks for hosting us tonight. Really appreciate it. Uh, we, we had a day of extended uh, professional learning for all of us as educators throughout the district. Uh, we uh, learned about uh, resiliency and uh, that important work. Uh, we, we know we have a shortage of bus drivers, but what we will soon find is that we have a shortage of all positions in public education. And uh, it's not projected to get better, it's projected to get worse. People are not um, uh, attending our institutions of training uh, throughout the state that uh, helps to license new teachers. We've seen a 40% drop off in that. And uh, we continue to see people choosing other careers. And we know that that, uh, is a danger and a problem for all of us throughout society. Um, we also had professional development today addressing learning gaps um, and how to help uh, our students close those uh, efficiently and effectively as possible and uh, safety and security updates as well. Um, so a, a good day of professional learning all throughout the district. We know it's not easy for our families to have kids uh, home on a, a weekday, uh, but this also affords our families the opportunity to celebrate this holiday in a way that they choose and allows us to continue with our own learning here at school. Um, a COVID update for us, uh, we are uh, seeing the surge that the community, the state, and the country uh, is seeing as well. We had our uh, highest number of cases last week at 264 student cases. That's the highest number we've had since the pandemic has begun. Um, and thankfully, those cases among students uh, are mild. 
the issue that we really are looking at, it's the same issue the hospitals are looking at, and that's really staffing. We need to be able to staff our schools. We need to be able to staff uh, our bus routes. We just had to cancel an additional route today with more uh, illness among our bus drivers. So what we're trying to do is to use the different layers of approaches that can help stem the tide of transmission. We know this Omicron variant is the most transmissible one of this virus that we've seen yet. And um, we are hoping to get through this surge in, uh, as, as quickly as possible. And again, maintain our continuity of operations. We want kids to come to school every single day and uh, we need the staff here to be able uh, to do that uh, as we go along. So um, we are keeping uh, mitigation efforts uh, in place so that we can protect staffing. We also, in talking with our medical and public health officials uh, who advise the district on mitigation efforts to take, um, they're also saying that uh, this surge is rising quickly and also has the potential to fall quickly and then have a period of real calm after that. So we're all hoping for that. Uh, the only caveat they gave me is, you know, November 1st, not November 1st, not many people knew what Omicron was. Uh, and so variants can happen uh, quickly. Uh, we know that uh, mutation of viruses happens during transmission and replication of the virus. So uh, we're just trying to uh, stave that off as best we can and get to that period of relative calm. We know that uh, having a school environment uh, that is uh, typical and normal for our students will go a long way uh, in helping them and our staff as well in all the work that they've been putting in to buffer kids from uh, the toughest aspects of the pandemic as well. Uh, we are continuing the uh, required work of uh, gathering input from all of our stakeholders regarding uh, the planning around the uh, emergency funds that are available, uh, referred to as the ESSER acronym on that. Um, our state legislature, and uh, we just so happen to be represented by uh, Representative Thomas Elbert. He is the chair of the House uh, appropriations committee so he had a lot of work to do uh, with establishing the state law uh, for the use of these federal funds no funds can come from the federal government and go through the Michigan budgeting process without the state legislature's approval so that's where it took a little bit longer but our legislature put in both of uh, an equalization aspect to these funds to sort of smooth out the highs and lows of the federal formula allocation of these dollars but we still need to go through uh, a process of gathering input from our stakeholders. We're looking to use these funds to address any learning loss that has occurred as a result of the pandemic. It's about our students mastering the knowledge and skills that they need uh, to go out and uh, uh, live a life that they can follow their own dreams and do what it is they wanna do with all the knowledge and skills that uh, will be needed uh, for them not only to graduate from high school, but to uh, have a successful life. So we're looking with these funds to mitigate any of the uh, gaps that may have occurred as a result of the upheaval that the pandemic has produced. Uh, we are engaging with parent groups. We'll be engaging uh, with staff, students, uh, all of our staff, teaching staff, non-teaching staff, uh, community as well and um, then looking to uh, coalesce those ideas and feedback, make sure that they meet uh, the requirements under the law. The requirements are, again, that they're used to address learning loss. We have to have at least 50% of the funds to address learning loss, 10.3% of the funds to address after school uh, tutoring and support, and 10.3% of the funds used to uh, provide summer learning opportunities as well. Uh, so that's what we're looking to do with these dollars. Uh, there are not elements in the state law or the federal law that require us to adopt any uh, COVID mitigation efforts. Those two things are not tie barred in either the state or the federal law on this. So I just wanted to point that out as well. Um, so we'll continue with that work. I'll report again next month uh, on where we are with the progress uh, in that work as we go forward. Um, also, I'd like to report back to this uh, group. Uh, we talked about 
uh, where we're going, and you've heard me talk many times about the need to make some changes to the 6,600 hours that kids spend from seventh grade to 12th grade. Uh, my belief is that too many of those 6,600 hours involve a student sitting in a chair while an adult talks to them. And I think more of those 6,600 hours needs to be about students having experiences and practicing what it is that adults do out in the real world. Uh, we had a gentleman here tonight uh, speak about uh, the building trades, uh, something I'm very passionate about. Um, and he's absolutely right. There's great uh, livelihood to be made in that area, but we provide students with a very little exposure to that particular career, or really, quite frankly, the multitude of other careers that exist out here. And uh, too often, we keep the content that we deliver to students, we have them seated, a person talks to them, and it's too often it's disjointed. It's math purely as math in a silo. And it's not often out in the adult world that we run into a math problem all by itself. It's usually nested with some other issue that we're trying to figure out or some other problem that we're trying to solve or something like that. And so I am really looking at ways that we can continue to support our teachers who are doing multidisciplinary work, where they're inviting students into the uh, problems that adults are uh, working through in their day jobs and our businesses and others, um, and, and having some experience, some practice with this. You know, we do this in the fine arts all the time. We give the kids the tools that adults use. We give them the same instruments. We give them the same uh, scripts uh, to, you know, whether it's high school musical or something else. And we say, here, give it, give it your best try as well, and we support them with that work. That's really getting them on the road to that 10,000 hours that, that gets them uh, into expertise. It's not our place to choose uh, what it is that students are passionate about and going out and doing in the world. But what we want to do is to give them a little bit of practice and a little bit of sense of what that feels like. Rather than kids thinking that this will all become clear once they get to an institution beyond high school that may involve a lot of debt and a lot of money, we would rather have them have some practical experiences that are connected to real life work. Uh, and that also can better explain and uh, make a better connection with all of the content standards that we're teaching. So when we talk to kids about a, uh, a multivariate equation in math, that they really understand where that applies in real life in that regard. So to that end, I um, engaged with Jim Ayers. Jim is a retired uh, executive from Amway, spent 41 years at Amway, and uh, he is helping a variety of nonprofits with their strategic planning work and how they engage uh, various different stakeholders and had a great discussion with him about uh, what it is that we're trying to do to make the 6,600 hours of high school and middle school, the secondary school we call that, uh, more relevant to our students and more engaging for our students as well. He was very, very intrigued in this and uh, is gonna follow up with uh, some information back to us, so I look forward to bringing that back to the board and a way that we can also, again, engage a cross-section of all of our stakeholders in our community on this work. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'd just like to conclude, uh, uh, every January we have a governance uh, organizational meeting of the board where the uh, members of the board look at their various committee assignments and officer positions. And uh, as we have a, uh, a change in a few of these assignments, all still trustees of the board, I'm so very grateful for all of your work. But I'd li just like to uh, provide special word of thanks to Mary Bonk, Mary, for all of your time as president. Um, when I arrived in the district uh, in 2006, uh, you were just in your first term, I think, on the board at that point in time, if memory serves me correct, is that right? Um, it was back when we had four-year terms, I remember on that. But uh, Mary, I can't thank you enough for your, um, your support, uh, your listening ear, your thinking partnership all the way through uh, uh, this time and your service uh, to the district, your service as president, uh, personally for me has been extremely helpful and gratifying. So, so thank you very much, Mary. Really appreciate that. And Suzanne, I really look forward to working with you, continuing the work 
uh, with Marty as Vice President, Nicole, your work uh, as Treasurer and the things you're passionate about. Uh, Kristen, it's great to have you here as our uh, new Secretary. And uh, Maggie, it's great to have you with the uh, Liaison to the Foundation. I think that's another, even though it's a separate legal entity, uh, it's a great way to, again, uh, continue innovation in our district in so many different ways. Uh, Dr. Fawson, uh, your work already and your impact and your questions have been fantastic. So I look forward to a new year uh, as we're in 2022. And um, again, hopefully we can get this uh, Omicron wave behind us and things can look uh, and feel a little bit more familiar as well. Uh, that concludes my report for now. All right, thank you very much, Superintendent Dean. Um, with that, I will open it up to board communication. I'm gonna, I didn't catch you before, but I was gonna see if you have an update from the foundation that you'd like to share. Yeah, um, we don't have very much new information. We actually did not meet in January because of the snow days. Um, yeah. So we got a snow day too. Um, but just a reminder that at the gala, um, $100,000 was raised. And so that money has already been distributed out to classrooms um, around the district. Um, and just a reminder that some of the things that were purchased um, were sensory equipment, recess games, um, some gymnasium equipment, musical instruments, some items for STEM labs, and there's others, but those are just a few examples of what that money purchases for different schools in the district. Um, and then the other thing that's really important is that teacher grant window is open right now, um, and that's where teachers can submit a grant application to the foundation for something they'd like to use in their classroom um, or in their, in their building. Um, and those are due February 11th. Um, teachers need to submit those by February 11th to the foundation. Um, and applications for those grants are on the foundation website. And that is just fhpsf.org. Fantastic. And we have our director of the foundation in the back. So thank you, since we, since we could see, we can thank you for all the work you're doing in your new role. It's to see you in person. Um, any other board communication this evening? All right, at the risk of further embarrassing. I just go for to, it. I, I do, I just, I have to, because I have to echo the comments of the selflessness with which Mary has acted. Yeah, I know, you're gonna roll your eyes at me, but um, it's true. You, you have been uh, certainly a role model for me and I hope for others and, and others yet to come on the board, that this is service to the community. And it's, I, I highly value everything that you have done and everything you have worked to do. And we hopefully will continue that work. I mean, we got, we got a year, I don't know why we're really saying yeah. goodbye now. Um, but I just, I just wanted to really recognize the time pre as president because you did things over the pandemic that normally a president wouldn't do and really shouldn't do because you dealt with a lot of things that are not board issues. Um, I don't think the community understood that, but you helped a lot of people to understand that. Um, and I, I very deeply appreciate that you were in this seat a lot longer than you expected to be and a lot longer than you wanted to be. Uh, I, I said this once before, but not to everybody's ears. When Dan alluded to the fact that, yeah, these used to be four-year terms, and you ended up having to do extra time that you hadn't anticipated um, because of the change in the law, and, and then even another term beyond that. And so when, you know, six years ago, when I knew this was gonna be the last term, when you knew that and let us know even back then um, that this was gonna be your last term, the fact that we had that extra time is one that I do deeply appreciate it and I think the community appreciates as well. Um, and if they don't, they should. So thank you. Kind and it embarrasses me to know, and you know I don't like that, but I cannot reiterate enough what great hands this community and this district and these kids are in with all of you and the chairs you're in. I'm excited to hang out here for another 11 months and watch all that magic happen. But thank you for being standby. I appreciate well, and that's just it. I'm not saying goodbye. Good. <laughs> no, because honestly, they say a good leader leads their group better than they found it, and you have to be where you are right now. You're able to help guide us for the next 11 months, and. You know, it's, it, it is a hard position to be in during the pandemic, and I think that's one thing I wanted to say, all the time and energy that you have put into it. But, you know, as board members, being Board Appreciation Month, you know, I think all of you, it's been, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's easy to think it's just this one hour, but I added it up the other week, and it's about 10 hours a week. I mean, I mean it's a lot of hours. So um, I know there's been talks about people are going to be running, and, 
you know, these seats are going to be changing, and, and that's okay. If that's the way it goes, that's the way it goes. But, you know, we encourage people, we are an open book. If you want to, you have our, our emails are on the website, you know, we'll go for a cup of coffee, we'll go for a walk and talk, we'll, you know, we are open to sharing what these positions are like. I encourage you to show up to a finance committee, to show up to a curriculum committee, to hear what we're doing. The reason these get passed so swiftly is because we have conversations in those meetings that go about an hour and a half, you know, uh, if not more. Sometimes we have conversations outside of that prior to. We have a lot of information. When I say prior to, it's, you know, just the little pieces of information that we can get to bring to that meeting that help us be our most effective, that's what we're doing. So I want to make sure, um, thank you again, board members currently, and anyone who's looking future, we're, you know, we're here to help support you if this is something you want to do, so. Okay, all right, any other communications? I thought she looked like she had something to say. All right, well with that, um, if there are no other communications, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Should we allow Senora Vonk to do that? <laughs> do I have a second? Dr. Pasta. All right, and we are adjourned. Okay.